turn to 2 Timothy. We've come as far as chapter 2. I think we made it all the way through the first five or six verses, but we're going to back up a moment, take a look at some things so we can keep it in context. So if you'll turn in your Bibles there to 2 Timothy chapter 2, just put your finger on verse 1 for a moment, and we'll see what God has for us this morning. Father, we thank you for that work of your Spirit in our hearts. Lord, we thank you for your word because you didn't leave it to ourselves to figure it out. You put it in writing. And we believe your word to be inerrant. We believe it to be inspired. But we also believe it to be authoritative. It says what it means, and it means what it says. And because you are our Lord and not just our Savior, then you, you have the right because we have surrendered our lives to you. We're bought with the price. We're not our own. Because we have surrendered our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, then whatever you tell us to do, whatever you tell us to be like, however you tell us to behave, then we want to be obedient to that. But we also know it takes the strength of the Holy Spirit to do that. So, Lord, as you speak to us this morning, and whatever you're asking us to do, whatever you're asking us to set aside or add to our lives, Lord, then not only should we hear those things, because we need ears to hear, but Lord, give us the strength to do those things. We don't want to just be a hearer. We want to be a doer, as it were, of your word. So we just turn these things over to you, Father, and we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're in 2 Timothy, and again, by way of reminder, it is what we would call or classify as a pastoral epistle. Paul has written, well, let's see, three of those, four actually. He wrote to Philemon, who is a house pastor, as it were, in the city of Colossae. That was the first of the pastoral epistles that he wrote. And then he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus about the same time. And now as he's approaching his time of departure, he tells us in chapter 3 that he knows this time by the Spirit that he will not escape the judgment. He's there in the Mamatine prison. Hey, somebody asked me what the Mamatine prison was last week. Well, it wasn't just a jail. It was a dungeon that was dug in the ground, and they dropped you in through a hole in the ground, and they had a grate, as it were, a bars, as it were, that fit over the top of that. And so you were in there, knee-deep in human waste. You were strapped to a pole so you couldn't lie down. And so literally you had to sleep as you were hanging by the chains of your hands. And, and this is where Paul will end his life. He will be taken from that prison and he will be taken out to the Appian Way because he's a Roman citizen. Uh, they couldn't crucify him, and so they will behead him. He knows that his time of departure is at hand. He knows that whatever he's going to leave with Timothy as a way of encouragement, this is the final moment. And so as we've said, when we come to 2 Timothy, it's, it's though he's giving us his last will and testament. When you look at 2 Corinthians, we get insights into Paul's life. We get nowhere else. It's like his diary. But when you come to 2 Timothy, you understand as Paul is writing this young pastor, this, this son in the faith, as it were, he's writing to him, giving him final instructions. And so, you know, we can take this to heart because it has gravity. It has weight to it because we know that the things that are cooking in Paul's heart, those things that are most important to him, those are the things right now under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit he's putting pen to paper to. And when he came to chapter 2, now there's a, if you got your pad and pen out, there's a flow to this, and I want to give it to you. Because the flow is, he's going to encourage him, as we saw last week, that you're going to need to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Being a Christian isn't easy. In fact, Jesus said, all who live godly will suffer persecution. Jesus said, in this life, you're going to have trouble. And we're going to see why we have trouble, because we stand up for the truth. We're going to find out again this morning, because they hated Jesus, they're going to hate us. And that's okay. So he encourages him, as it were, in the first part of chapter 2, to endure hardship. And then as he comes to the midsection of chapter 2, we're going to get there this morning, that's where we'll pick up, he's going to tell them that you need to remain sound in biblical doctrine. Because there are going to be those forces that are going to try to come into the church. They're going to lead people away from the solid word of God. Into fables and into myths and into things that will, as it were, that will drown men's faith. And so he said, you have to remain solid in the preaching of the gospel and the teaching of the word of God. 
And then as he comes to the end of chapter 2, he's going to tell us now, when the Word of God has its effect on people's lives, it produces morality. All, all who live godly, all who live godly will suffer persecution, but you need to be living godly. He's going to tell us that that's always going to be the rub. And he's going to tell us in this chapter that all who name the name of the Lord should depart from iniquity. Those things should fall off. We should put off the old man, put on the new man. And then when we get to chapter 3, hopefully next week, we'll see. If we get to chapter 3 next week, then we're going to find out. He's going to tell us what we can expect at the time we're living in, the last days. And kind of give us a glimpse. He doesn't really need to give us a glimpse. We're already living it. We're seeing it. And the things he describes are those things going on in our culture. that are going on in our world today. And the battle that we're going to face. So he reminds them of the battle. So it makes sense. He's going to say, you need to be a good soldier. You know, you need to keep preaching and teaching the word of God. You need to keep challenging people to give their lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and all who name his name should be departing from iniquity. We should be new creatures in Christ Jesus because there's a battle coming. There's a war on the horizon like we've never seen before. And I find it quite interesting, and I was sharing this with the men on Monday night, I find it quite interesting that Paul was living in a time where the church was under Roman persecution. Paul will be beheaded on the Appian Way about 64, 65 AD, about the time that Caesar Nero burns Rome down and blames the Christians. And so at this time, after Paul's departure, if you're a Christian, you were put under the sentence of death by the Roman Empire. Paul says of himself, that there was a messenger of Satan that buffeted him. That's spiritual warfare. And, and you read Paul's life, you know, pr in prison. I could probably handle the imprisonment. Um, he said that, that, that he was beaten, eh, maybe beaten and, and scourged and, and stoned to death and all of those things. And even a day and a night in the sea. Now, I don't know about that. You know, when you get out there bobbing around in the Mediterranean Sea, no doubt you could hear that dun, 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 dun. But, but he suffered all of those things. And yet he tells us, that the time you and I are living in, we're going to see that next week, is perilous. Much more than the time he was living in. He said the first century church had extreme difficulty. We were under persecution. The blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs became the seabed of the gospel. But he says, as I look forward, there's a time yet coming when it's going to be perilous, seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. That's why when he's talking about these things in chapter 2, we need to pay attention. So let's just pick up chapter 2, verse 1. Let's, we'll kind of read through it to get the context. And then when we get to verse 8, that's where we'll really start our study. He says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, let me make note of this. Let me take time to develop this just for a moment. He's going to tell us in verse 8, he's going to bring us back to this idea, to this fact, to this concept, to this precept, to this doctrine. Because as I said last week, the most misunderstood doctrine in the Bible is the depravity of man. You see, we think that we're good people. In fact, I've heard some people say, well, that's a, that guy's a good guy. He's really a, a nice guy. If he would just become a Christian, he would make a great Christian. Because he's really a, a, a nice guy. He, he's good. Or we think that becoming a Christian is taking a bad person and making them better. Which nothing could be further from the truth. Satan wants us to believe that lie. Because the truth of the matter is we are dead in our trespasses and in our sins. We are declared by a holy God to be unclean. In fact, that holy God will tell us that there's nothing good about us, that our hearts are desperately wicked. They're desperately so. How many would say that you, before you got saved, you were a desperado? Just raise your hand. Maybe some of you need to raise your hands too. You know, you're still working through that. No, listen, he's saying that we, were, we came into this life, listen carefully, in a condition, in a situation that we could do nothing about. King David said, you were conceived in sin, you were born in transgression. When John writes uh, his gospel, when he comes to chapter 3, and we all know the verse, for God so loved the world, 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have age-abiding life. We all know that verse, but there's verses before and behind that tell us that, listen, if when you come into this world, you are already under the condemnation of God. We're not condemning the world. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. The world is already condemned. If you're here this morning and you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ and you haven't received that gift of eternal life that he's willing to give through the washing of his blood and the regenerating of his spirit, then you're under the condemnation of God. Listen, your future is hell. Jesus came to rescue us from that. He came to provide a way outside of ourselves that we might be washed, cleansed, and be able to stand before a holy God. And that is the message and that's what Paul's going to remind Timothy. That is the message. The message isn't come to church, be better. Come to church and do good. The message is come to church, drag your dead carcass in here, as it were, and give it to Jesus. And he'll pour life into you. He will wash you. He will cleanse you. He will sanctify you. It's a work of the Spirit. I know, man. I, 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 I drug my carcass to a Bible study 48 years ago, stoned. And God sobered me up, reached into my heart, touched something so deep. And that night before I left that Bible study, I was saved. And he started that process of sanctifying me. So watch what Paul says as he's reminding him he's leaving. You be strong in grace. Because already he's telling us that all of Asia has departed from Paul. They've left the preaching of the gospel of grace. And they've gone back to Judaism and all of the religious systems of the world for their justification. In fact... When he writes to the churches in Galatia, that's that region that he's talking about up there, Pontus, you know, Pontus and Cappadocia. He said, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? One question I have, having begun in the Spirit, being born of the Spirit, being a recipient of God's grace, being washed in His blood, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by your own efforts and your own flesh? And so he's saying it's almost like you've been bewitched. And so the gospel message that has to remain pure is that we are sinners. We are unclean. We are undone. We are deserving, as we come into this world, the wrath of God. But God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to bring grace to us, favor against merit, to wash us in His blood, to pay for our sins on Calvary's cross. And by the way, if you've accepted that, everything you ever did wrong, He nailed it to His cross. And then he dares the devil, the accuser of the brother, go peel it off if you think you can. Because we find out when we get to heaven, none of those things written against us will matter because he's already forgotten and forgiven all of our sin. Amen? Isn't that a wonderful gospel? You know, but again, he's saying now you need to be strong in grace because the tendency will be for people to fall out of that and go back to religion, to try to do it on their own efforts. Um, can we just say this this morning? I can do nothing, say that, about my condition. But I thank God that in Christ Jesus, I have been declared sinless. Amen. Doesn't that sound good? I like it. Mikey likes it. Anyway, he says, Thou therefore, son of man, be strong in grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then he says this, And the things that thou hast heard among many witnesses, commit those to faithful men that they may be able to teach others. Our job is to go out into this world and tell people, not that you're a sinner. They already know that. I knew that when I was a sinner. Go out and tell them, man, there is hope in Christ. Christ Jesus stands ready to forgive you of all of your sins. He's already paid for it. You just got to open up your heart. Don't you hear him knocking? Open up your heart. Let him in. And he'll find all those junk drawers and begin to clean them out, you know. We have one. Well, we, I think we have two. Everyone should have one. I have one in my shop. He says, so you need to hold this truth, Timothy, the truth of God's grace, of his love, of his forgiveness, of that work of his spirit. You need to tell men that they can do nothing about their condition, but there's one who stands ready to wash them and regenerate them and cleanse them in his own blood. And then he says this, and when you preach this truth because you're calling men to something that the devil doesn't want them to hear, then you have to endure hardship. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ, 
Because no man that is warring, and by the way, you're in a war. We saw that last week. You're in a battle, and this is for the souls of men. We're not wrestling with flesh and blood. Paul says to the church at Ephesus, you're wrestling against principalities, powers, and a host of evil wickedness in high places. We're in a battle. And so he says, every man that warth, he doesn't entangle himself with the cares of this world that he might please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. So he uses the example of a soldier. Secondly, he uses the example of an athlete, that an athlete has to be disciplined. You know, that's one of the things that people don't want to hear today, that you have to be disciplined as a Christian. There's a discipline that should come to your life, and he's going to talk to us about that at the end of this chapter. But listen, that athlete that participates in the Isamamian or Olympic Games, he is disciplined so that he might win the prize. And then lastly, he says the hardworking farmer, as we looked at last week, and he says, listen, you can't give what you don't have. You see, in those days, they didn't go down to the feed store and buy their seed. They had to they had to reserve part of the crop that they grew so that they could dry it out so they could get the seed from it for next year's crop. And what Jesus is saying, that you can't give. Because what the world doesn't need is religion. It needs relationship. And if you don't have one, you can't give it away. You have to have. And it has to be real. It has to be vibrant. The Lord Jesus Christ has to own our hearts. We have to be passionately in love with him. And I'll tell you, that's infectious. Amen? It is infectious. And so he says, as he ends that little section, he says, consider what I say, consider these things, and the Lord give thee understanding. Now he comes to verse 8. That's where we pick up this week. He said, remember. And that word doesn't mean, you know, constantly call to remembrance because I have to do that. I'm getting old. But he's, it's not just trying to remember things. This word here in the Greek means to constantly have in the forefront. To constantly have it in the forefront of your mind. This is what you need to constantly be thinking about. This is what you constantly be pulling up, as it were, and having it before you, as it were. He said, you need to remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. What's he saying? That Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. Had the Jehovah Witnesses pull into my driveway yesterday. I happen to be standing out there doing something. And they pulled in. And two of them got out, and one sat in the car, and the one sat in the car rolled down his window so he could hear what the two were going to kind of try to deceive me about. And so when they walked over, I said, listen, before you say one word, I got one question. We need to answer this question before. Just keep your literature in your hands. Do you believe that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was the eternal word of God taken on human form? Was he conceived of the Holy Spirit? Was he born of a virgin? Did he live a sinless life? Did he die a substitutionary death on Calvary's cross for our sins? Is he risen from the dead on the third day? And is he ascended to the right hand of the Father? And is he ever living to make intercession for us? Well, let me tell you what the watch... I don't care what the watchtower has to say because the watchtower can only deceive. But in Jesus, you must believe. Do you believe that? They said, no. I said, then put an X on my driveway and don't you come back with your false teaching. You are false prophets and you are deceiving me. And leave my neighbors alone too. I'm going to watch you as you drive out of this cul-de-sac. Get on down the road. And the other guy's rolling the window up, man. And the other two are trying to scurry. I said, keep your deception to yourself. You are deceived. Remember. Remember. Timothy, don't let anybody rip you off. That Jesus Christ, our Messiah, the eternal word, in the beginning was the word and the word became flesh and he dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the one we serve. Remember that, he, that God became a man. He took on human form. And he was the perfect man because if by one man, Adam, sin could come into this world. By one man, Jesus Christ, righteousness could reign. And he took our sins out of the way. Don't ever forget that. That has to be central to your preaching. 
And this morning, I want you to know that you can be forgiven apart from anything you do. You just have to open up your heart and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He'll come in and clean the mess up. He's already paid the price for your sin. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Don't come knocking on my door on a Saturday interrupting my life trying to lay your heresy at my feet. I got up, I got loud. And my wife said, well, you know, I went in and I said, did you hear that? She goes, well, I heard you out there. What was going on? Well, those false prophets had the gall to pull up my driveway, get out with their false literature and try to deceive me and think that I could be good in myself. But that Jesus was only maybe a prophet, that, that he was the brother of Michael the archangel, when I know him to be my Lord and my God and my Savior, my only hope. My only hope. And so I'm pretty sure they stopped at the end of the driveway. They looked back at my address. I'm pretty sure that I got a big X on that map now. And good enough. You know, because if they would have said, well, let's, yeah, yeah, we believe that. Well, then let's talk. Let's talk. Remember, Timothy, keep it to the forefront of your mind. Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. In fact, let's just turn there. 1 Corinthians, if you've got your Bible, they'll put it up on the screen if you don't have a Bible with you. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, listen to what, what Paul says, just the first four verses. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, this good news. Man, is it not good news for us? I declare unto you this good news which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. By which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you unless you have believed in vain. And here it is. Here it is. For we deliver unto you first of all that which I also received. Paul received this from the Lord. He said how that Jesus, listen carefully, how that Christ died for the sins of the world according to the scripture. He didn't just die. He died for the sins of the world. Yours and mine. And that to prove that he had life, he rose, well, he was buried. We know he was not mostly dead. He was completely dead. He was buried and he rose again the third day. Listen, that is central to what we believe. Amen? Aren't you glad that you're, you're washed in the blood? Aren't you glad that you're saved by grace? Aren't you glad that Jesus paid the price for your sin? He took your sin upon him and he gave you his rights. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that he gives that to you? Daily, he says, so remember that. And he says, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Paul is saying, I am suffering because I teach, I preach, I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way back to the Father. Religious people, you know, Paul said it when he wrote to the, to the churches up in Galatia. He said, that which is born of the flesh persecutes that which is born of the Spirit, Ishmael and Isaac. And even so it is to this day. Because man in their pride and in their religion want to build their own bridge back to God. But you and I come along and say, we can't build a bridge. God sent his son and he stooped down and he became the daysman. He put his hand on God and he built the bridge and he put his hand on me. And in that I trust. And in only that will I trust. He said, I suffer. You know, in John chapter 15, when you read through that chapter, you find out that Jesus, when it comes to about verse 18, he says this. He says, listen, they are going to hate you because they've hated me. Because if you were of the world, they would love you. If you could get woke instead of being awoken. If you, if you could say it's okay to live a life of debauchery. It's okay to live a life of sin. It's okay to, to call yourself a Christian and live this way. Uh, the world would love you. But you and I can't do that. You and I can't do that because we're born again and we understand that we've been regenerated by it. We have to live differently. He says, so they're going to hate you. And then he tells us in chapter 18, verse 37, why they hated him. When he was before Pilate, 
He said, you know, are you a king? And he says, well, you say that I am, and I am, but my kingdom's not of this world. But I've come to bear witness to the truth. And what's the truth? That men are lost, that they are undone, that they are fallen, that they are conceived in sin and born in transgression, and they come into this world under the condemnation and under the wrath of a holy God. And I have been sent by my Father to come and pay for their sin. I've been sent by my Father, as it were, to tell them that they can have forgiveness of sin in me. I am the door. I'm the only door. I'm the way. I'm the only way. I'm the only life. I'm, I am the only life, and I am the only truth. And those who come to me, I will turn no one away. And you can receive forgiveness of sins. In fact, you can receive life. That's what he says. And so he says, listen, this is why they hate me. Therefore, I endure all things. Now watch what he says here. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, for those who have not yet come to faith. We endure all things. We're in the fray of it. We're in the fight of it as good soldiers of Jesus Christ, enduring this hardship because we're in the battle for the souls of men. Therefore, I endure all all things for the elect's sake that I may also obtain salvation, which is that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus unto eternal glory, unto eternal life. You know, we endure the stuff we have to. You know, you go to your family reunions and man, they're blowing smoke in your face or they're uh, you know, ostracizing. They're doing all those things, but you hang in there. You hang in there because you don't know that they won't come to faith to the saving of their souls. That's why we endure these things, he says. He says, so if we suffer, listen carefully, back up verse 11, it is a faithful saying, and this is the challenge for you and I this morning, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, Paul said he was crucified with Christ, nevertheless he lived, but it wasn't his life anymore. It was the Christ's life. It was Christ in him. Jesus said, you want to be my disciple? How many want to be a Christ's disciple? Raise your hand high. Hold it up there. I want to look around. Who want, who want to be a, a Christ's disciple? Well, you know, salvation was free. We just talked about that. But you know what it costs to be a Christ's disciple? Jesus said, you want to be my disciple? Then you have to take up your cross and deny yourself and follow me. Paul said that I might know him, the fellowship of his suffering. Jesus said, if they've hated me, they're going to hate you. And we're okay with that. But we just keep doing what we're doing. We endure this affliction for the hope someday that those people will come to the light. 17 years I witnessed to my father. And finally one morning, having breakfast with him at the kitchen table, he looked at me and said, why would God have you and not have me? I said, why would you say that? He said, when I was in Malvern, Arkansas, at a Sunday school class in the Assembly of God Church, that they told me if I didn't accept Christ today, he wanted nothing to do with me from that moment on. So why would he have you and not have me? And I said, well, someone lied to you. Well, he says, it's too late for me. And I said, well, is it too late for the thief on the cross? And I never saw my dad cry to that moment. And he wept. And see, he was receiving that forgiveness of sin. As he was receiving, as it were, that gift of eternal life. And so he, he's telling us here, listen, if, if we are dead with him, uh, dead to the accusations of this world, dead to the criticism of this world, we, we're, we're no longer man pleasers, we're God pleasers. He says, listen, this is a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we believe not, you know, it was that gal that I was witnessing to in Philadelphia. Remember, I got caught up in a gay parade, and, and as we're moving along, we came out of a building. We were taking the kids back to start a church there in Philadelphia, and we got caught up in a gay parade. And, you know, the gal to the right of me was dressed in purple with a backwards collar and a rainbow flag. And I looked at my other pastor friend and said, man, listen, we get an X stage left because this is being, there's a stage there. They're televising this thing that people back home are going to turn on the news and see you and me that in a gay parade. And so we started shuffling our way out of it. 
And I've told you the story before. There was some ladies over there with a sign that says, God hates gays. And, and I went over to her and I said, no, God does not hate gays. You have the wrong message. God loves them just like he loves us. And I said, you ought to pack up and go home. And, and so when I left there, that lady came running over to me and she goes, man, I hope you gave it to him. And I said, well, I am one of them. I'm a Christian. But that's not the message. I said, God loves you. He doesn't hate you. Well, you know, if I would have hit her with a two by four, it would have had the same effect. You should just look on her face. You're a Christian, and you're saying to me that God loves me. I said, absolutely, he loves you. What he hates is your sin, because your sin separates you from him. And Jesus came to deal with your sin, to pay the price for your sin. And you've got to accept him into your life. He said, well, I don't believe the Bible. Well, she knew I was quoting from the Bible, obviously. I said, well, you don't have to believe the Bible. But you could go up there on Independence Hall. You can jump off the roof and you can yell all the way to the ground. You don't believe in gravity. You're still going to hit the ground. Because, listen, who God is and what he is and what he offers, it has nothing to do with your, with, if your belief system. Even if you don't believe, God remains true. She goes, well, I was born this way. And I said, well, I agree with you too. She goes, let me get this right. You are saying, as a Christian, God loves me. I said, absolutely. You're saying to me that you agree that I was born this way. And I said, listen, we're all conceived in sin and born in transgression. Pick your poison. I said, if I would have met you before I was saved, I'd want to beat you guys up. I was homophobic. But now I'm not. Because I'm concerned for your soul. I want you to come to know freedom because you're out here protesting because you want people to be you're saying you want people to be tolerant and i've been tolerant have i not she goes most tolerant and i said but you don't want tolerance you want acceptance and i can't give that to you because the one who loves you who sent his son to die for you to bring you into fellowship with him can't accept it either but if you'll come to him, he'll clean it up. And she left saying, you gave me a lot of things to think about. I hope I see her in heaven. But even, listen to what he says, if we believe not. Those people say, well, I don't believe that. It doesn't affect God. If they believe not, yet he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. He's, listen, he's going to do what he's going to do. And then he says this, of these things, put them in remembrance charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearer. Isn't it interesting how many things the church can get tangled up and arguing over that have nothing to do with the souls of men? How much time and effort we can give ourselves to things that have no eternal value. I, I can't tell you, since we've been on the radio, and you know, we're on a number of radio stations, and you know, years ago when I started speaking at the Brian Call Conference, so we kind of have a worldwide audience, it's amazing to me how many people call me and want to argue with me. Just the other day, I had a guy call me, and he goes, is this Pastor Mike Warren? I said, yeah, you, you got him. The secretary had already left. It was late in the afternoon. He goes, you know, I heard you on the radio. And, 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 and I said, well, that's good. And he goes, no, it's not good. You know, what you said wasn't biblical. I said, you need to stop. Right. So what is your bent? Well, I just believe that God is loving and everybody's going to heaven. And No, 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 not true. You have to be born again. Jesus said you must be born again. Then I had another kook call me up. This one I hung up on and he stayed hung up. But this guy called me three or four times. And said, well, you know, you're a mystic. And I said, no, not a mystic. Well, you say you hear from God. And, and nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that God's people hear from God. And, and then you talk about going into the mountains and getting alone with the Lord. And he speaks to you and you speak with him and you have this wonderful fellowship. You're a mystic. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. I said, sir, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And they follow no other. Oh, and by the way, even Jesus went up into the mountains to be, spend time with his father. I said, don't call me again. He called me three times. I kept having to hang up, hang up, hang up. And finally, the last time, he said, give me your email address. I want to, I want to debate, debate you. I said, listen, there's a knob on that radio. It's all the way to the left. There's a knob. Turn it all the way to the left till you hear a click. If you don't like what you hear, just turn me off. You're not paying the bill for radio. We are. So just turn it off. 
Because he says here, listen, watch this. Don't get tangled up with those things. He says, but study. The pastor's job is to study God's word to show himself approved of God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed because he can rightly divide the word of truth. So keep the gospel in the center of your teaching. Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then, Timothy, teach the word. He's going to tell him in chapter 4, teach the word, preach the word, be in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Because the time will come, and we're living in that time, when men will not hear sound doctrine, but they'll heap themselves teachers telling them things like, this is your best life now. Writing books about it. Can you believe it? If this is my best life now, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed. Because when I read about heaven, it seems like a whole lot better place than this. And that's where I'm going. Study. And then he says this in verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings. Profane. The word, prof it comes from the Greek word profana. It means anything that's not sanctified in the temple of God, that's outside, that's unclean. We want to talk about Jesus and the work of Christ. We want to talk about salvation. We want to talk about sanctification. We want to talk about presenting our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable in the Lord, because it's our reasonable service. We want to talk about what Christ has done and not what we're doing. Amen? He says, so those profane things, man, just leave them alone. Vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. I can't tell you how many churches today have people call me and tell me that our church went woke and they're all this woke stuff and they want to talk about, you know, your finances and how to be taller and all. Listen, the pulpit is for the teaching and the preaching of the gospel. It's there where the word of God should be ministered. And he says, well, listen, this is just going to increase. You know, Paul told us in the last days there'd be a falling away from the biblical faith. He's telling us at the time we're living, there'd be seducing spirits, doctrines of demons. And so he's telling us, you shun the profane things because they only lead to more ungodliness. You know, James, the Uterine brother of Jesus, the older of the brethren that were born to Mary, his mother, after he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, you know, James almost didn't make it into the canonization of Scripture because people thought, you know, the, the, the third century people that were putting together the Bible, they, they, were, they thought that James was teaching works instead of grace. But they didn't realize, and that's why he finally made it, because they did come to the understanding, that he was talking about antinomianism, which was a false teaching that was sweeping through the church at that time. Antinomianism is against law, which means that if you are saved and you've given your spirit to God, then you can live any way you want. And this was the early forms of Gnosticism. And Gnosticism thought it's the spirit because the, the material universe is evil. The spirit is good. Serve God with your spirit. Love God. He loves you. And then you can live as debauched a life as you want. In fact, they were giving themselves. In fact, to prove their, their false teaching, they would have these junken orgies. Say, look, at the flesh is just what it is. So give yourself to the flesh as long as your spirit and as long as your soul loves the Lord. And these were some of those things that were profane that here we find Paul telling Timothy, be careful about that, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And yet we see in our culture, in the church culture today, people saying, God loves you, and if you're saved by grace, it's okay to be sleeping with your girlfriend. It's okay to do drugs. It's okay to be drunk. It's, no, it's not. Not for the true believer, it's not. And Paul's going to address that. I was that before I was saved. And the very night I got saved, I knew that that didn't need to be part. Nobody told me. The Holy Spirit told me. Out the window, the stuff went. No, we offer these vessels unto the Lord as holy instruments filled with his presence, filled with his Holy Spirit, washed in his blood. Why would we continue? You know, Paul says, as he writes to the church at Rome, he said, listen, because they were saying, shall we continue in sin now that grace may abound? And Paul said, God forbid. What are you thinking, man? 
You, you are dead in Christ. You've been buried. The old man is buried. You've risen to newness of life. You need to walk in newness of life. Now, we don't get it right all of the time, but that should be our passion, should it not? And listen, if we don't get it right, we should be broken and repentant. We don't live a life of debauchery. We live a life of holiness unto the God who called us to holiness. Can I get an amen? He says, so listen, this is going to just increase unto more ungodliness. And he says, and their word will eat. It eats away as doth a canker. It eats like cancer. Sin will eat you up. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. It will eat you from the inside out. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Don't sit in a cage in a jail cell with the door removed. Get up and walk out. Amen. He's going to tell us in a few moments. Flee unrighteousness. Pursue. Follow after godliness. We're Christians. We're born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in us. The Spirit of truth. The Spirit who convicts and leads and guides and empowers us. To walk this life. Listen, we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. Listen, old things have been done away with. All things have become new. We put off the old man. Can I get in a minute? We put him off just like a suit of clothes. We put on the new man. We're walking in newness of life. We want to walk in relationship with our Father through that work of Jesus Christ and through the regenerating of the Holy Spirit. We are born again Christians. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We're going home. That's who we are. We're not like this world. We're not of this world. We should not emulate this world. In fact, we should do what Paul said to the church of Corinth. Come out from among this world. Be my people. Don't touch the unclean thing. I'll be your God. You'll be my sons. Who want to be a son and daughter of God? Now I know. Now I'm doing with the preaching instead of the teaching. I know. I get excited about these things, man, because I'm going home. Don't you lie to me. Don't you tell me it's okay to sin and separate me from relationship with my father. Don't you tell me that. Get down that driveway as fast as you can. I never saw a guy roll up a window so fast. Man, he was cranking away. Take your false stuff somewhere else. Don't tell me it's okay to live a life of debauchery. I'm born again. I'm washed in blood, the blood of Christ. So he says here, for this is going to increase, and, it's going to, and their words will eat like a canker, of whom Hymenius and Philetus, they're of that sort. You know, Paul names them. You know, people say, you should name names. Well, Paul did. Can you think of a few people today? Okay, I'm not going to name any of them, but can you think of a few people today? If you followed their teaching, it would lead you away from a relationship with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and God the Father. Okay, enough of that. Let's move on. Whom concerning the truth, the truth, that we want to walk in the truth, they have erred. And they're even saying that the resurrection is past. It's already. And they're overthrowing the faith of many. Watch what he says. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The foundation of God. Paul said, I've laid a foundation. Of this gospel. You can read it. I think it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He said. I laid. I think it's verse 10. He, I laid a foundation. Which no other man can lay. That's the truth. And be careful how you build on it. He comes to Ephesians chapter 2. And he says. We are built upon a foundation. And the foundation is the apostles. New Testament. Prophets, Old Testament, Jesus Christ himself, the Gospels and Revelation. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. We as the church are built upon this foundation. Amen? And we're fitly joined together for a habitation of God by his spirit. Because the Lord is here this morning. He loves you. He wants the communion. He wants the fellowship with you. He lives in your heart. He wants control of your life because if you give him control of your life, things will go well. If you don't, they don't go so much. And so he says, watch this, and it is a seal. You know, in, in Ephesians chapter 1, he says, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You know, if we had, you know, in, in our auditorium here, because 
we use this for everything, that we have black lights that we can come in and we focus on the carpet and it tells us where the chairs go. You can't see it, but they're underneath every one of the chairs. So when we tear down and have our banquets and women's have their tea and all this, we come back in and we get the black lights out. We look now and here's where all the chairs go. We, we make it simple. But God has a light one day. He's going to shine on your forehead. And there's either going to be a seal there or there's not. Oh, and by the way, if you're sealed, Satan can't break it. Because it's the same word used when he is sealed in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And he can't break that one and he can't get out. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And what God has begun in us, he's going to finish. And one day the Bible says he will present us faultless before the Father of glory. He will present us faultless before the Father of glory with exceeding joy. Amen. He's going to get you to the other side. He said, listen, nevertheless, the foundation of God stands assured, having this seal, and here it is, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You know, Warren Worsby had a conference, oh, it's been a few years ago, a number of years ago, that he was one of the speakers that had a number of guys come and speak. And, and, and the conference was about the counterfeit church. That thing out there that calls itself the church is not the church. It's a counterfeit. And one of the things he uses as an example in his teaching on the counterfeit church, he says, now, a counterfeit dollar bill, it looks good to the untrained eye. Oh, it can circulate, as it were, uh, through the community. It can circulate through a state. It can circulate through the United States. And to the untrained eye, it still looks like it has value to it. And you can trade, as it were, things for it. It seems to have some value about it until it reaches its final destination. You take it to the bank, and the trained eye examines it, and they either declare it to be fake or real. And one of these days, every human being is going to stand before God Almighty. And it doesn't matter what you look like here. Because he says, many will say, look what I've done for you. And when they get there, he's going to say, depart from me, your work of iniquity. I never knew you. Well, what do you mean? Look at all I did. He said, you didn't get it. I wasn't looking for what you could do. I was looking for you to come broken to me so I could heal you. I wasn't looking for you to be religious. I wanted you to have a relationship with me. And that can only come through the work of my son. I never knew you. I didn't come to make bad people good. I came to make dead people live. I was dead 48 years ago. I was dead. I had no spiritual life. And that light shined into my heart. And I was born again. Now I have a relationship with the Father. And when I stand before him, he's not going to say, Mike Warren, what did you do? What good thing, what list of things did you do? What, you know, give me some accounting so that I would think about letting you into my kingdom. That's not what he's going to ask. Just like when God judged Egypt, which is a type of the world, he told his people, you take a lamb, you examine it for five days. Jesus rode in, as it were, to Jerusalem. He was examined for five days. And on the fifth day, you slaughter it at the doorpost and you take the blood of that lamb and you put it on the lintel and you put it on the doorpost, forming two crosses. Jesus bore his, you need to bear yours. And he said, and when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. When he sees the blood. So if I get there and he says, well, why should I let you in? The blood of Jesus Christ it's been applied to my life. And if you have any confusion on whether I'm saved, go talk to that man. Because he told me if I would come to him, he wouldn't turn me away. 
He told me his grace is sufficient. He told me that if I believed in him, I would be saved. And then he told me after I'm saved, teach my word. Go feed my sheep. And so this is what Paul is telling Timothy. Listen, there's a seal on us. We're not the counterfeit. It doesn't make us better. We still struggle. We still fall. We still make mistakes. But we repent because we want to live a life pleasing to the Father. He says, listen, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. But if a man therefore purge himself of these, what? Of iniquities, of sin. Purge yourself. Ask the Holy Spirit to purge you. Ask the blood of Christ to wash you. Listen, that's not our life anymore. We're dead to those things. But if you purge yourself, he says, of these things, he says, then you shall be a vessel of honor. You shall be sanctified. You shall be fit for the master's use. And you shall be prepared unto every good work. That's us. And now he says, flee. Watch verse 22. Flee. Now, I've had people ask me, well, what exactly does it mean to flee? Well, if you're walking down a path, and we got a bunch of those out here along the Yuba River, and at this time of the year, this could be a possibility. If you are walking down a path, and all of a sudden you hear this rattling noise, and you look on the path, and there's this big, fat rattlesnake, do I have to tell you what flee looks like? No, 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 no. You will jump and scream like a girl if you're a man, and you'll run away. If you're smart, you will. I know a few people in this church probably try to, try to catch it. But no, no, no. If you're smart, because it's a snake, and it's poisonous, and it will do you harm. Why do we flee iniquity and unrighteousness? Because it will kill us. It will kill us. It will harm us. And so Paul would say to Timothy, you remind the people, flee also youthful lusts. Now I've had people say, well, you know, what, what, are, what are youthful lusts? I'm old now. Do I still? Yes, you do have, still have youthful lusts. Those things that started when you were a teenager, man, they're still cooking in you today. Are you kidding me? You know, um, one of the great revivalist at the turn of the century, uh, D.L. Moody was asked by a young man when he was 84 years old, hey, D.L., when was it that lust was no longer a thing that you had to fight? You had to bring those thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. At what point did those things go away for you and you no longer had to battle them? You know what D.L. Moody said at 84 years old? I'll let you know when I get there. No, 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 we flee these things. We flee them daily. We know that they can harm us, they can hurt us. We flee, you fool us, but we follow after, as it were, righteousness, faith, love, peace, with them that call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. Now listen, who you keep company with will also mess you up. We follow after righteousness with people who desire to do the same. Amen? My dad used to tell me, birds of a feather... Up together. Uh, bad company corrupts good morals. Those are Proverbs. Did you know that? So he says, be careful. But foolish and unlearned questions, just avoid them, knowing that they only gender strife. You know, there's this thing that people do, and I've noticed it over the years when I'm witnessing. You're witnessing to somebody and you're sharing the gospel, and you can see the Holy Spirit is working on them. And then just out of the clear, they'll say, well, well, then where did Cain get his wife? You know, because it's what, what it is, is they're distracting you. It's taking the focus off what's going on right there and trying to put it over here or put it over there. You know what my Stan Pan asked? Because I get asked that a lot. Well, where did Cain get his wife? Well, I'm always concerned about somebody will be concerned about another man's wife. You need not to be concerned about another man's wife. What about you? What about you? You know, there's just all of these distractions. But he's saying here, listen carefully, guys. Don't get caught up in that. You know, there was a guy one time, I was a young Christian, that had testimony service on a Sunday night. And he stood up and he says, man, pray for me. I'm studying the deep things of God. 
I'm thinking, man, so am I. Maybe I ought to get together with this guy. Maybe we ought to like iron sharpening iron. He goes, yeah, I'm trying to find out how many wings an angel has. Isn't enough to know they fly? You know, who cares? That's not the deep things of God. And man, they will sidetrack you. Don't get involved in those things. But you, listen, he says, don't strive about those questions that just gender. But, but he says this, but the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Ready to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. It's in the Abatic. There is a truth, and it's not progressive. It is as solid as it is dyed in the wool. It is set in stone. And he says, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. When we come into this life, we are snared by the wicked one. We've, we've been captured at his will, and Jesus came to set us free. Amen snared of the devil who has taken them captive by his will. And so as we look at the end of this, and we'll get into the next section next week, you know, Paul is telling Timothy, listen, Timothy, you're going to have to endure some hard things because people are going to hate you because they hated the Savior that we serve. In fact, Jesus says in the last days, we're going to be hated of all nations for his name's sake. Amen? Because they don't hate you, they hate truth. Because we're here to tell people that you are a sinner, just like I was. But there is a Savior who stands ready to forgive you, but you've got to bring your whole life to Him. You've got to give it all to Him. And so you're going to have to endure these things, but hold the gospel of Jesus Christ to the fore all of the time. Tell people that Jesus Christ of the seed of David, God incarnate, came to die for their sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. And teach the truth. Teach the whole Bible to them, Timothy. Lay that foundation underneath them so that they won't be deceived by the counterfeit. And then tell them, Timothy, that if they're going to follow Jesus, if they're going to name the name of Christ, then they must depart from iniquity. Because in a great house, there are many different vessels. And you want to be a vessel of honor. You want to be fit for the master's use. So therefore, flee, Timothy, your youthful lusts. Follow after righteousness and holiness and godliness. And just keep remembering that there are people out there that need to come to this realization. That God wants to set them free. And so you keep at it. Because there are people that are in cages that Jesus has already taken the door off. And they don't know. And I was telling the men when I witnessed the people, I treat everybody like they're already a Christian. You know, the other day I was in BNC and I was talking to a man and I said, hey, brother. And he, because I was, he just kind of looked at me and we kind of caught eyesight and said, hey, brother, how you doing? He goes, I'm doing pretty good. I can't find a bolt over here. We're in a bolt and nut section. And I go, wow, okay. And I said, man, can you believe what's going on in this world? He goes, yeah, man, it's getting... To be bad, isn't it? Can you believe what's going on in this economy? Yeah, it's getting bad, the inflation, all that. Can you believe it? And they wanted to take it toward the Democrats. They say, yeah, 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 but, but man, can you, can, our, listen, our hope is not in another president. Aren't you glad that we're going home soon, brother? Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ is coming? Aren't you glad you're saved? Aren't you glad you're saved? Aren't you glad that Jesus is going to come take us out of this mess soon? We'll get to go home. And you're going, <laughs> you treat them like they're a believer and you share the hope. They already know they're sinners. That guy agreed with me. Because Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Don't get tangled up in this stuff. You and I are soldiers and there's a war coming. And we're going to have to endure some things. And we can't get entangled with this world if we're going to be at war and a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, as you come to Christ, whatever you're struggling with, whatever he's convicting you of, ask him, Father, help me. I want to serve you. Help me. Give me the strength to say no to those things and yes to you. Because I want to be a vessel in these final moments fit for the master's use. Amen. Amen. Do you want to be a vessel fit for the master's use?
Amen. Well, let's stand. Let's get the worship team back up here. Read ahead. Read ahead about perilous times. Read ahead about seducing spirits. You know, read ahead and, and tell me if what you read doesn't fit this culture today. It's amazing. Amen. But aren't you glad this morning? Listen, listen, guys, gals. Listen, brothers and sisters. Listen, sons and daughters of the Most High God. Are you not glad you are saved this morning? Amen. Are you not glad that, that your father is about to send his son, Jesus Christ, to receive us as his bride? Are you not glad?